Um, thanks, Shane. And I just wanted to introduce Tobin Dommer, who's been kind enough tonight uh, to host this event. Um, Tobin is the fintech attorney at Shepherd Mullen and uh, the go-to man. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. I'll keep. I'll keep it short. Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, Another great panel, Pimo. So uh, an interesting week or two, for sure. So uh, lots to talk about, I'm sure. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks, Tobin. So now I'm going to pass it over to our coming out of rewirement <laughs> moderator. Pierre, thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm glad that Shane didn't steal all our thunder with the news. I think there were a few things that took place that he did not cover. And hopefully uh, we'll cover it here. So first of all, we have an, an awesome panel for the topic at hand. Uh, mainly because these people are very experienced, have been in the space for a long time, uh, and will offer some awesome perspectives. Uh, the only disappointment is that the moderator who was originally supposed to be here is not here, and so you're stuck with me as a backup uh, player. So with that, I wanted to level set for the audience and, and at least have each of the panelists kind of give us two minutes on um, kind of a summary of your background and maybe a little bit about what role you've played relative to ICOs, whether you've been an advisor to one or have facilitated one or uh, are involved in one directly, just to give a sense to, so everybody has a sense from where you're coming from and, and your perspectives. Michael, why don't we start with you? Sure. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, Michael Hughes, I work for Indiegogo on our equity crowdfunding and ICO token sale platforms, which we'll get into, but um, I come from various startup backgrounds, from TaskRabbit to Zipcar and a lot of sort of sharing economy type companies to been doing a lot of um, fundraising work, particularly on the equity crowdfunding side, originally with accredited investors and now with new rules that we're all aware of. Um, so yeah, the last couple of years, Indiegogo, we invented crowdfunding 10 years ago, um, 2008. The laws didn't exist to do investing. We actually wanted to do investing, so we invented Perks Crowdfunding. Gone pretty well. We've done billions of dollars on that side. Ten, eight years later, it finally caught up, and we launched our equity crowdfunding platform in 2016. I don't think it should be called equity crowdfunding. It should be called crowd investing, because it doesn't have to be equity. I've been leading that effort, and then we just announced our... ICO token sale platform in December uh, this past year. We did one pre-sale that was very successful. A lot more coming this year. Uh, we've been inundated by not only startups, but Fortune 500s. I mean, everyone on earth is coming to us to say, please help us do this and do it compliantly and do it with a real brand and keep us out of jail. We're like, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tammy Camp. I am founder and CEO of, of Stronghold. It's an asset management platform um, for crypto. It allows asset managers to be able to have custody and trade on behalf of their clients, and their clients have a place to log in and make positions and reporting. Um, I've been in crypto since 2013. I was the first head of growth um, at Stellar. Org, um, which is now probably a top 10 uh, cryptocurrency. Um, my role in this ecosystem has been, um, I've served as an advisor to, um, to some token sales. Um, I've invested in some token sales. I've listed some token sales. I've market made for some of them. So um, I think we're potentially exploring one now. So I think, um, you know, have a view of being around um, probably all sides of the table at this point. Hi, I'm Sunny Singh. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of BitPay. Uh, BitPay is the largest processor of Bitcoin in the world. So we've been around since about 2011. Raised over $60 million in funding from top investors like Founders Fund, Index Ventures, Richard Branson. So essentially we allow merchants to accept Bitcoin. Companies like Microsoft, Newegg, and we're actually trying to make you know people spend Bitcoin around the world, and it's actually working because we'll process close to about four billion dollars this year. And most of you are saying, "Well, I've never spent Bitcoin." Well, it doesn't have to be for you guys. It's people around the world that might not have access to credit cards or bank wires are too inefficient. Bitcoin really does solve a good pain point. Uh, we stayed. We purposely stayed away from ICOs as a company. However, me personally, I've been involved in a lot. So I've either invested or advised several ICOs, including Civic, um, Unicorn, Wax, um, Science, which is a venture capital firm that raised some money. So I've kind of seen the ins and outs and all that. Hi, my name is Patrick Barron. I'm the president of Ambisafe Group. Uh, we are based here in San Francisco. 
We've been involved in the space for a very long time. Our roots go all the way back to 2009, 2010, doing very early development on the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, our company was incorporated in 2015. We started originally as a white-labeled web wallet provider for Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, we incorporated an exchange mechanism, a broker model, where you can uh, buy and sell uh, directly from the company. This happened to be a really useful tool for ICOs when the ICO craze hit. So we started licensing our software to uh, uh, companies that are launching ICOs. We got a lot of questions around, hey, can you help us write a smart contract? Can you make some technical contributions to our white paper? Uh, we spun up a services division where we help companies with their ICOs. Uh, we take them on. It's kind of like an accelerator. We help them with their white paper, make introductions to legal counsel, to tax advisors, um, developing the MVP, really getting the go-to-market strategy right. And then we provide a couple of different token sales mechanisms, one of which is our white-labeled wallet. Uh, we also have a, a ICO launching platform called orderbook.io. We're building this out to be regulatory compliant. So as we all know, there are a lot of regulators, specifically here in the United States, but globally, that are coming down and saying, hey, you got to follow the rules. If this falls into one of the buckets that we have, you got to make sure that you're doing Doing it the way that we said you have to do it. And so what we've done is that we're, we're creating a platform that has things like know your customer checks, anti-money laundering checks, accreditation verification, and then programmatically enforcing in the token the sale and the secondary market exchange of these tokens so that if you're the issuer, you can know with confidence that the token is not going to go into the hands of a purchaser that it's not supposed to. So we're we, what we're doing is that we are moving in the direction of incorporating as many of these regulatory compliant aspects globally that we can to help uh, not only the, the regulators make sure that everybody's following the rules, but more importantly, the issuers, the entrepreneurs, and you, the token purchasers or the sellers, to make sure that you don't accidentally break the rules. Uh, so we've launched, I don't know, 30 ICOs, helped raise several hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, we're very deep in this space. And I'm very happy to be here tonight. You're all beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Chess Du, and this is for Revive Music and China Speaking this panel. Uh, I'm the founding partner at the Kobe Fisher Mattress. It's a blockchain focused fund, and I focus only, it's blockchain only fund. Uh, we're a decentralized fund uh, with an offshore entity. Um, so, for coefficient, we invest in the whole blockchain ecosystem, including tokens and uh, equities. Uh, so, for the tokens, we have portfolios including Filecoin, uh, Radio Network, and the Open Zipling, and uh, Orbit, and uh, Tari, a bunch of stealth mode uh, projects. I personally am the advisory board for uh, TomoChain, which is a scalability solution for Ethereum based in Singapore. Uh, the founder is the uh, previous founder of Lane, uh, which is top 10 per cryptocurrency right now. I'm advising him to do a new project. And they also advise the board for um, Altex, is a kind of like a, a much better solution for Alta. And they have much stronger technical teams uh, there, and uh, definitely very excited about it. And also, I new joined a stable coin project at the advisory board based in Australia called Haven. Uh, it's pretty uh, popular right now. Um, so and also um, helping with lots of projects, top tier projects in terms of uh, if it's a recent project, I helping them connect with the top resources in Asia, uh, like Filecoin. I helping them connect with uh, the, the miners in China and uh, to uh, facilitate the adoption of the Filecoin. Uh, and also helping with some uh, Asian projects like College, uh, few like very top projects in terms of international expansion. Um, so basically, for Coefficient, we do uh, investments, we do advisory, uh, also we do uh, project service to actually facilitate the whole industry move forward. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, uh, so, so since the last time speaking, this uh, event ho ho hosted by uh, the same host, uh, I, I think uh, just like two months, the industry moves very fast. Uh, like we see, like last year, the Tesla Falcon successfully raised like two hundred million more. Uh, but right now, uh, I think uh, since January, uh, for projects I uh, could get very favorable for investors, the, the hard cap is usually like uh, thirty million. 
But right now, it's kind of like in the bear market. Even thirty million, um, if you don't have very strong team, it's very hard to raise in the SEO. So basically, it's not you do an SEO, you can raise money. It's not like that. The market crack itself is really quickly. So uh, I think in the uh, twenty eighteen, it's gonna be much more healthy and sustainable. Only the teams that have very strong blockchain tech background, they also really blockchain projects, not like something software complex plus blockchain um, that could be success. And uh, uh, and also, uh, we definitely could uh, maybe have a big chance in this year, maybe market have a big crash. Um, if we can see right now in the bear market, uh, that's actually helpful for this whole industry uh, because those are the types of projects, they probably cannot um, persistent in this space. And only people that are really passionate about blockchain could survive and uh, live in this you know, so great do some really cool things that could uh, open a new world that is new financial system. Thank you. Sure. Um, so look, it's, um, uh, you know, first of all, let me do a little quick poll of the room. Uh, how many people uh, have purchased uh, non-primary tokens? So let's say none of the currencies, but some of the ICO tokens. Just a show of hands. Great. And how many of you are thinking about uh, raising an ICO, uh, money through an ICO or something of that nature? Right, okay, so it's pretty much the right team. So with that said, let's go to the next question. I'm gonna um, really try to get at when is a company or a project ripe to be doing an ICO? And this time, Patrick, I wanna start with you. Sure, so that's a really good question. Um, there's a couple of answers to that. There are, there are businesses that have an opportunity to tokenize a specific part of their business model where it can make sense. And then there are startups that are doing something very new. Uh, so, uh, you know, really the question becomes uh, what is the function of the token in this project? Why do you need a token? Uh, do you actually need a new token or could you use something uh, like Ether to facilitate this? So answering the question of why you actually need a token as opposed to, well, ICOs are raising a lot of money so I want to do an ICO and I'm going to bolt on this solution. That's a really bad reason to do an ICO. So understanding what it is that you're creating and why you need a token in order to do that. Now from that point, you know, really what we've seen uh, progress over the past 12 months is that you really have to have a community associated with your platform in order to have a successful ICO. Uh, the, as, as she mentioned, there is a tremendous quantity of ICOs that are taking place. I would, I, and uh, you know, there's some very high quality ones, but there's a lot of noise and it's very difficult to be that signal in the noise. So for example, a project that we worked with recently, Referium, they were able to generate over 100,000 members of their Telegram group uh, before they even started their token sale. And needless to say, they filled their hard cap very quickly. Uh, and so what we see is that you have to have community engagement. The community has to be interested in what you're doing. I would also say that you have to have the right team in place. The team is super important. Uh, does the team, uh, do their background make sense? If, they, if you get the money that you're seeking, will you be able to deliver on it? Have you done something in the past where the story makes sense that you could probably do this in the future? Uh, or are you missing blockchain expertise uh, completely? So, you know, another question that I would ask is the timing right. Do, is the technology at a place where your idea, where your project is going to be able to go to market and get the traction that it's needed? Or uh, it does, do we need to have a billion people with crypto access before this is gonna take off? So answering the questions around timing, around team, uh, around engagement, these are the really the important questions that I would ask and, and use to filter. Cool, cool. Hey, Tammy, well, how about you? Same, same question. Hey, when, when do you see deals as right for doing? Um, let's see, I typically, and this is just like totally like, what I really like to see. Um, I, I like to see things that have already been built, uh, that already have traction. Um, this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like old school startup. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, so, so Civic was a good example of that. Um, they did a token sale that last year, and um, you could actually, uh, it's a KYC app, and you could uh, use their application to register for their own token sale. So they were essentially dog fooding or using their platform to KYC for their, their own token sale. Um, so I typically like to see that. And, um, you know, the size of the, the investment amount, they're usually between 
like 25 million to what, 75 million these days. So um, that's you know a series B. Right. Um, so I typically like to see it, um, you know, as someone who has raised before with a great team and credible background. And, you know, when they get to a certain stage, uh, preferably a later stage, um, then they, they go out to do a token sale. So, so I guess you are not doing a lot of token investing? Because by, <laughs> by that criteria, <laughs> I'm not sure that there's that many deals That's to look at. Not true. That's actually not true. There's quite a few that are... There's quite a few that have things that are built. Yeah. Cool. The rest of them. Cool. Yeah. Chance. Yes. What? Oh. <laughs> 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 So basically, it's uh, about our investment thesis. Uh, the the major uh, we have like three criteria. The first one is the team. Uh, we look at the team. Uh, the f top one is is how how long you are in the blockchain space. You are actually before the hack, or with, like coming with this hack. If you are before the hack, that means you really passionate about itself, the blockchain, the cryptocurrency itself. Even you go through winter, that as the teams like as good sun they love this industry because I think it definitely in the winter time only those teams can go through the winter time uh, to live and participate systems to create a new something new. And the second, uh, it not necessarily have to. Uh, second is the team have very strong technical background. Uh, where I'm not a tech person, but uh, I'm very favorable with the team have very strong uh, the, the the engineer background. If and um, especially your CTO, if your CTO not convinced me enough, you can actually build your, uh, your your tech. I don't think I can put money in you. And uh, the second one is the, the terms, the can terms like the cap. Uh, right now we're looking for the cap that is under thirty million. If you are above that, unless you're like Falcon Neville or Tesla, so it's kind of like really. Um, really, really a bold vision, and the, in the space long time, really kind of like a, a novel idea. I, I could feel me excited. Um, then I think probably it's hard to convince me. Uh, and I think a very strong tech or professors uh, jump into uh, create a cool projects. No, nobody can solve that problem not, unless you know, it's up to you, and that could convince me. And uh, the third criteria is we're looking at some like kind of like she said a prototype or if you have a prototype or uh, you have some like test net ready right uh, like Tomo chain we invested when we invested uh, so for for example the Tomo chain is very the leading investor of their their round um, so the founder have experience they founded Lane project in twenty fourteen. Uh, that in this case, long time doesn't really understand deeply space. The second, the cap, they only raised like eight million. Um, uh, build a six scale solution, scalable solution for Ethereum, which is really small cap. And the third, they have testnet ready. They have wallet ready. Uh, they have lots of the stuff like a product type ready. So just this three criteria, we just put money and be the leading investor and helping them structure whole thing and become extremely successful. Um, for these projects. So basically, that's those are things we're looking at. Hey, Sunny, how about you? And what criteria do you see? Yeah, so uh, I kind of look at a couple different ways, actually. First off, only raise an ICO unless it's really the right fit and you, it makes perfect sense. Um, if you can raise a Series A round and that's better, do that, actually. Because once you go down the path of raising an ICO, you're, now you're, that, you're an ICO company for the rest of your life. And there's been no exit check for ICO because it's a new space, so the companies might not want to buy a company that's done an ICO that's not from an ICO space. So you start to put yourself in a pigeonhole, which we don't know how this is going to turn out. Then obviously once you're on the ICO space, you don't know what's going to happen with the SEC rules and all that kind of stuff is still in play. So again, if you can raise a Series A round on your own and you don't need a token, go do that with my advice. And yes, you do have equity, but it's better to do it that way than try to raise an ICO where you're trying to time the market Hope it works out well and all that kind of stuff. So that's the, about the timing part. The second thing I look for though, it's kind of like Tammy. I actually, the companies I invested in or advised, where Civic was one of them, Unicorn had raised a $10 million Series A round, uh, Wax is actually uh, Opskins, and, and Opskins is a customer of BitPays, and they process several hundred million dollars in skins trading a year. So I know that was a real company too as well. And Science is a venture firm that was on fund too actually. 
So everyone I invest in or advise in had already done previous rounds before and had a business that was tractionable and sustainable. So I wasn't worried about losing everything. Where in ICO, a lot of them you could lose fully everything, and I wasn't really worried about what if it doesn't start trading, I knew the business model was still there and they'd be around for a long time. Do you consider an ICO to be an exit? <laughs> not, not for the founders and owners actually in the company. Because a lot of them are still locked in and they can't take the money off the table yet. And then once you, I mean, it might be an exit for the investors that put money in, right? Um, but once you invest, once you, if you're the company and you do an ICO, you may be a five person company. Well, guess what? You now have to deal with all the issues of being a public company almost, where investors are calling you guys. You know, they have no equity shareholder in the company. They're calling the company every day saying, why aren't you listed on Binance? Why aren't you listed on Binance? Why is it going so low? Why is it trading up and down? And you have to spend all your time, and you only have five employees, managing doing investor relations, actually. And you have no time to actually focus on building a real product yet. And that's why I think you're seeing a lot of these companies that have done ICOs still haven't developed products because they're spending all the time managing the ICO part of it still. Yeah, and I think one of the important things that he mentioned is that uh, that it, it can be a long time to exit if you're a founder, and this comes back to ICO governance and token governance. And one of the evolutions that I've seen over the past 12 months is that 12 months ago, nobody even looked or cared what the incentives were for the founding team and for the engineering team. And that has very much changed. That's very much a red flag. If you're doing an ICO and you're keeping 20% of the tokens and they best instantly, if I'm looking at that, I'm not gonna participate because you can go buy a Ferrari with that money and I can't do anything about it because of, you know, because of the nature of a, a quote unquote utility token. So uh, this is one of the things that if you're thinking about doing an ICO that you should definitely take into consideration and very much emulate what we see in traditional, uh, traditional startups uh, with a, a vesting period and uh, something that gives you an incentive to continue working on it. So, so um just to interject on that, um, I think what's important um, with respect to the vesting issue, at least right now, and we'll see how the SEC process works through, uh, vesting looks like a security. And so if you're going to take a utility token and have a vesting schedule associated with it, it will be treated as you're treating that as a, as a security. So I would be very careful about the notion of vesting. You might want to give tokens to your employees, but as soon as you put a vesting uh, a model on top of it, it starts to play out to be a security. Right, so uh, for those online, uh, what he was saying, if you couldn't hear, was that if you're... Uh, oh, they can uh, hear, uh, trust me, they, this is... This <laughs> one can hear this guy. Sure. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I would add anything to that, what I would say is that the very first hire that you should make outside of your CTO and the CEO is a securities lawyer, if you intend on uh, launching in the United States. <laughs> uh, there's no way around it. The government is very much, uh, they are very tuned into this, uh, into this industry. They're looking uh, for people who are doing it incorrectly. They are looking for people who don't follow the rules. And uh, there is a very thin path that we can currently walk down in order to facilitate this type of entrepreneurship in the United States. And so you need to have good legal advice and good lawyers to advise you on these types of things. Which is great that you, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say one more thing. So being involved in FinTech for many years before BitPay, um, you know, people would leave banks all the time and say, I'm gonna launch a FinTech startup company, and they're from, you know, North Carolina, New York, and they'd say, I'm just gonna come to Silicon Valley and raise a Series A round on Sand Hill Road. And they would try, and obviously wouldn't work out. You know, everyone outside Silicon Valley thinks it's so easy to go raise money on Sand Hill Road. And I think everyone who hasn't done an ICO now thinks it's so easy to go raise money for an ICO. That times of all, it's gone now. It's very hard now to raise an ICO. You know, half the people here are trying to raise an ICO. You're all competing for the same money. The current investors are no longer giving out the money they did last year. The SEC rules coming down upon you. Everyone's very skeptical. You need to get an ICO off the ground. How do you get it listed on these exchanges now? So I think the glory days of the easy money is all gone. Now it's a grind, just as it would be trying to raise a Series A round. Hey, hey, let's not be doom and gloom yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> so with that, um, I wanna ask something. Uh, I I think uh, it's just to be much healthy. Uh, and not not doesn't mean you need a small cap. That means if you need a much bigger money, you, you then work out. Uh, and the small cap is the project should come as your own coin price. It's not that you're not making money and your employees not incentivized by ether's money. Ether, you should incentivize by your own token. Uh, so basically, that's 
Well, I, I think a small cap also makes sense. So that makes me doesn't mean that if you raise a small cap, that means as the market is still down, then I just think it's much healthy. I just think that's much more sustainable in the future. So, um, Michael, on, on your platform, as you think through and help companies consider what they need to do through this, uh, what are some of the most important components or advisors or service providers or pro what, are the, what is the thing that's important uh, or the things that are important in getting through this process? What do you really have to line up to get through it? Team, 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 and a few other things. But I mean, so our platform is, is new, but it re so the way we set things up is, again, we've we look at this as crowdfunding 3.0, right? This is just raising money from the crowd. We feel that it should be from anyone. If you just want to do it from an accredited investors, we can do that. If you want to open it up under the proper securities exemptions to non-accredited investors, we've been doing that for a year and a half, and we know all of those exemptions. We have a broker-dealer partner who gets audited regularly by FINRA and the SEC. Hey, mom. Is it some mom gone? Um, <laughs> You know, so we're we're all about rigorous, rigorous compliance and due diligence. So the first and foremost, I think a lot of these people noted that if an ICO is the right route for you, the first thing we look at is we look at it just like we look at any fundraise and say, what's the team like? What is what does the traction look like to date? You know, what's the what's the business model? Like anything, any Sand Hill Road investor I hope would look at, some don't look at any of it. But, you know what I mean? Like a good investor would look at, and then we say, okay, let's look at your white paper. The white paper, the white paper isn't just something you write just to like, you know, hey, we did a white paper. It's the white paper is a very detailed document, just like a PPM is a very detailed document on an accredited, you know, Reg D raise. We look at everything. The token economics are very important. People talk about that, like how does the token function? What does the reserve look like? Are the can people cash out on day one? Definitely red flag, sorry, we're not interested to. Um, how much money are they raising? A lot of people, I think Tammy nailed it. I, I love that description of Indiegogo raised a Series B from traditional investors, you know, Kleiner Perkins, Richard Branson, and others, $50 million or something a couple of years ago. We've been around for 10 years, okay? We've done billions of dollars in sales, billions. We raised a $50 million, something like that, Series B. And Tammy nailed it. Like, if you're raising $75 million and you're three guys on a napkin, it's like, what do you need $75 million for and how are you gonna manage all the money? So we look at kind of all that stuff, I'm not really answering the question, I'm kind of answering the previous question, but <laughs> I mean, uh, and, also, and also counsel, right? I mean, we have our own internal GC, general counsel, who's incredible. We're partnered with Cooley, who, you know, our counsel actually came from the SEC and works on the FinTech team at Cooley. They do an independent white paper review outside of our own review. I mean, there's like multiple steps to get through this thing to make sure everything is up to snuff. Um, and then typically, our platform, at least currently, we're more sort of the marketing, we can bring the community that was mentioned. We have millions of people across the world, but you definitely have to line up your community. What is your plan to do marketing? If I can give you any advice, I've been working in crowdfunding for years, and this is just crowdfunding, is it's all about momentum on day one. And people mention that, like, Filecoin, love what those guys are doing. But every venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road was in that deal before that deal. Okay, so like, that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's amazing. Probably not you. Maybe that's you, I hope that's you. But like, get your community lined up. How are you gonna market this? How are you gonna bring in investors? We can pour gas on the fire to our community, but people that come to us and they just kind of expect us, oh, we wanna raise $30 million, you can just promote it to your community. That's not how this works, and that's not how any fundraising works. So we really look at like, have people thought it through? Do they have a well put together white paper? What do the economics look like? How much are they raising? And does is the team the right team to take this forward and take 20 million, 10 million, 30 million dollars and actually execute? Um, the last thing I want to say is it was mentioned like, we currently, I mean, who knows how it'll evolve? Like we don't build your token. We don't do a lot of things. We don't, you know, draft your white paper, things like that, we'll review it. We want to make sure you have people in place to do all of that important stuff. So like, we love working with other people that like, hey, you can go manage the Telegram group and you can draft the white paper and you can do all the, you know, this, that, and the other thing. This is a partnership game. Like, this isn't one person does everything. And I feel like sometimes people come to us and they're just like, and by the way, we do all the KYC, AML, investor accreditation. We, again, our broker dealers been doing that for eight years. That's just like bread and butter for us. But like, have you thought through that? Have you even like considered that as a thing? Have you, ha, have you thought through all the different steps and who's going to manage every step of that process? That's a really important thing to kind of 
ping someone on it, if they don't know the answer right away and they're kind of hesitant, it's, it's definitely a red flag for us. So very, very rigorous. Like everyone, we're paying close attention, but you know, our, again, I'll say it again, our job is to keep everyone out of jail and that's what we intend to do. Hey, Patrick, you have a platform too, so maybe this would be a good question for you as well. So, you know, how do you guys view that, that process? And maybe add, how long does it take to do an ICO? So tell us both about the, the pieces that are necessary, what you see as advisors that are necessary, service providers, and then about how long the process takes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll start with the second question and then go back in terms of timeline. Uh, I would say that a minimum of three months, that's if everything is lined up and you've got the, the team and you've got a great version of the white paper and uh, you've got a minimum viable product almost ready to go, you're looking at about a three month timeline. Uh, some projects take much longer than that. You know, we're dealing with startups. Startups have a very high failure rate. Startups pivot. Startups come up with better ideas. This is very a natural part of the process. And it can take as long as 10 months or longer if uh, if you've got some of these things to work through. You want to make sure you only have one shot at doing an initial coin offering. Right? So you got to make sure that you get this right and make sure that you have all of your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Uh, so it's very, it, it depends is the answer to that. Momentum is very important. Building out your community is very important. Making sure that you have all of the regulatory legal documents in place and that you've got a plan and that you are going to follow the rules and that you know what the rules are are very important. Uh, in terms of what we look for and the process and these types of things. I kind of hit on this earlier. First and foremost is the team. You're going to hear that over and over and over. Uh, this is, you know, I, what I hear is that I would rather invest in an in a, a team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. So the team is super important, making sure that you have all the crucial pieces in place, making sure that you have some sort of minimum viable product. I believe she mentioned that uh, so that you have something to point to. If it's going to be a utility token or have some utility, we want to see it working at the time that somebody is able to purchase it, that's super important. And then ultimately, you gotta, you gotta cultivate your community, you gotta promote the project. Fundraising is a full contact sport. Make no mistake about it. You can't just sit back and run banner ads and assume that you're gonna make, you know, bring in $10 million. Like, that's, that's 12 months ago. Sorry, you missed the boat on that. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, I would also say that the amount that you're looking to raise is one of the things that many people look at. So it, you really don't need $200 million in your seed round, so that's kind of greedy. I think that you're probably gonna buy a Ferrari with that and you're not gonna work very hard. Uh, or a Lambo, excuse me. <laughs> you already have your Ferrari, you're buying a Lambo. Uh, that's not okay, that's not what this is about. This is about building amazing businesses, facilitating entrepreneurship, reaching billions of people. And one thing that we have not seen in this industry is that we haven't seen a company that's a billionaire. And I don't mean a billion dollar valuation company, I mean a company that has reached a billion people. We haven't come anywhere close to that. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I want to see. Can I just add one thing about advisors? A huge red flag to me is if you have like 25 advisors. <laughs> you see this all the time. Like I'm only 38 years old, but I have two kids now, so I feel older. And it's just like, wait a second. So you're, you're 22. First of all, I hate you because you're so young. I love you. But like, wait, you advise 30 ICOs? Like, what, what does that even mean? Like, that is... Again, seriously, like we look closely at that. Like, if Sonny is on your advisor and he's doing like one of three companies he's advising, and clearly he knows his stuff in fintech and Bitcoin, etc. Right? He's really sad. Like that, we're like, oh wow, that's impressive. Or Tammy, oh my god, like she helps Stellar get to be like she. People know what they're talking about, and they're like, and they're actually a legitimate advisor. <laughs> like that's cool, but like don't just put advisors just to think like, oh, we have this is like thirty advisors right away. I'm like, nope, next. No, no one has 30 advisors that add value, that's impossible. I get asked to be an advisor every day via LinkedIn from people I've never heard of in my life. <laughs> and I don't respond to any of them. So I'm an advisor of three companies, all I've known for a long time. Um, <laughs> great, so look, um, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the elephant in the room. The SEC is uh, active. Um, so look, the last uh, six months, um, they've been taking slow steps forward to let us know how they're going to begin to assess the space. Uh, we saw the Dow uh, release, uh, press release uh, from the SEC, we then saw the Munchie uh, press release, and most recently the testimony uh, from the SC, uh, CFTC and the SEC. Um, so in light of some of the statements being made, some of the actions that are being reported, um, how are you coaching the companies that you're working with 
um, to, to address these issues, to think about them, to assess risk around the space, and, and maybe chance. why don't we start with you on this one since you're also an advisor to several uh, companies. Well, what's the question? What's that? <laughs> what's the question, Cody? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we start with Patrick and I'll come back. <laughs> uh, uh, well, let me, let me first say that uh, I think that uh, I don't advise companies on how to deal with the, IC, uh, the SEC or any government regulators. That is the role for your lawyer and your legal team to do. This is why I said that you need a, a very good lawyer. You don't just need a good lawyer. You need a lawyer that practices securities law in the United States if you intend to either, one, be incorporated in the U.S., two, live in the United States, or three, sell into the United States. You have to have good legal counsel who's following what the SEC and what the CFTC and what FINRA is saying and how it applies to you. Um, you know, what I would say is that uh, our regulators have a really tough job. Uh, this is an incredibly complex industry that we're in and it changes on a daily basis and the technology is moving incredibly fast. And I know this because I'm in the industry and I learn something new every single day. And uh, our regulators, they have to not only learn the technology and understand what it is, but also deal with all the other things that are on their plate and then try to protect consumers, you know, which is ultimately their goal. Their goal is, uh, talking about the SEC, is to protect grandma in Kentucky. I can say that because my grandma lives in Kentucky, right? So they have a dual mandate to one, facilitate entrepreneurship, uh, two is to protect consumers. And finding the balancing act I honestly feel like they've done a pretty good job so far of, one, not squashing the industry like what we've seen in China and what we've seen in South Korea. Um, I would say that the other end of the spectrum would be what we've seen from Singapore and what we've seen from Switzerland, very clear guidance. You know, what I would like, if I were speaking to my policymakers and my elected officials, what I would say to them is that we need a, a new set of rules for this new technology. This technology doesn't necessarily fit easily into the bucket of what we have in place. And it's something, it's a new creation and it should be treated as such. With that being said, we don't have new rules. We have old rules. And the rules that we have are what are being enforced. And so you need to have legal counsel that can help you understand what those are and how those are going to apply to your project. Uh, Danny, how about you? <laughs> I know it's a hard. I know it's a hard. <laughs> I love uh, this much. I know. It's, it changes so fast. I think I got an email today um, from a friend that said that if you're doing any type of ICO now that you need to register with FinCEN as a money service business. Can we get a subpoena? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just um, just yeah. Kidding. I know. I know. How many subpoenas? So it was like 40. No, no. 80. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Request for information. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so I, like now it's just uh, proceed with extreme, extreme, extreme caution um, and probably find the most conservative securities attorney that you can um, if you want to move forward with this. Um, there's, um, you know, I think the, the S head of the SEC was saying that he thought that all of them were or securities, um, including like, um, you know, even Ethereum. So um, it's, what? Well, yeah, <laughs> it's no, true. The SEC doesn't actually come out to say that the Bitcoin is. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, but they also haven't come out <laughs> saying that Bitcoin is not a security. So, that's right. again, so, they are fairly yeah, It is actually. Um, but, uh, but Ethereum did do a token sale for more, so that's why, uh, why it would be classified that way. Um, yeah, so, you know, things are changing daily. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's just my recommendation, was to find a securities attorney that um, you trust and um, that can keep you out of jail. Wow, <laughs> attorney recommendations, this is <laughs> intense. I think you have three options as of right now. Um, you can, if you're trying to do an ICO, you can go really, really fast and do a utility token and try to sneak it in, hopefully and not get caught before the rules change and raise a lot of money. That's one option. Yeah. Option two is um, you can try to do a security token, get everyone accredited, follow the letter of the law that's intended to come down, and follow that way. And option three is go offshore and not raise with American investors and play the Asian with your pin markets, actually. Those are kind of three options you're looking at right now. You can decide which way you want to go and play it out. I'm going to have my thoughts. So 
I agree with saying that there's definitely options. I, so, okay. I want to level set too. So, let, let's take Filecoin, for example. Okay, Filecoin argues utility, and I actually believe they do have utility. I think it's awesome what they're doing. I'm say that again. They did that raise under Reg D. Okay, that's a securities exemption from accredited investors. Okay? Even they did it under Reg D just to be safe. So, my point being, our platform, again, we've been doing equity crowdfunding for a year and a half. Like, this is equity crowdfunding all over again with the SEC. Equity crowdfunding still hasn't been figured out completely because they're like, wait, what? We're going to let non-rich people invest? That sounds crazy. It's like, yeah, of course that's a thing, but they're still figuring it out, right? And the laws still aren't perfect, but like we've been navigating it with them. If I had a coin for everyone, a coin, well, I said a dime for everyone that said they were like, help write the Jobs Act or was there, like, but our founder, Slava Rubin, like actually helps shape the Jobs Act. Like he's been doing this for a decade. We've been part of this. We've helped. We welcome the regulation. We talk with the SEC. My team's going to meet with the SEC next week in DC. We met with them here. Our lawyer, like I said, spent six, seven years at the SEC. She's at Cooley now. Like, this is all going to get regulated. There's no debate. Like, that's it's already happening. And that's a good thing. Like, so my point being, the pre sales, just so we're clear, a pre sale, by definition, even if you're claiming utility or it doesn't matter, has to be done under securities law. And there's two ways to do that. I want to be clear, I'm not a lawyer, but I've learned a lot. There's two ways to do that. You register directly with the SEC, which almost no one has done, but people are thinking about doing, which I think is really smart. Why wouldn't you go straight to them? Or you use a security exemption, okay? Reg D, Reg CF, Reg A+, Reg S for international investors. Our first sale, it was a pre-sale, raised $5 million, called the Fan Control Football League. They are claiming a utility token. We believe they will have utility later. We did not do an ICO. We did a pre-sale under Reg CF, where they could raise up to a million dollars from non-accredited US investors. Reg D, they could raise unlimited from accredited US investors. And Reg S, where they could raise money. Reg S doesn't distinguish between non-accredited and accredited. They're just outside of the US investors. All three of those people, you would come to the page, you were put into the right bucket. Everything we're doing is under securities law right this second. Okay, and in, to my mind, that's just the way everyone should be doing it. Like, we're only operating under securities laws, even if it's utility token. It will get figured out. My belief is that they will come down and figure out some sort of, here's what a utility token looks like. They're going to have to figure it out. You know, we'll revisit that then. But like, if you want to be safe, just use securities laws that have been around forever and securities exemptions. We're not the only ones doing that. Like, do it right. Just to be clear, Munchie, all these people, the people that get the headlines went around the law and they said, I don't want to deal with the US regulation. I'm just going to say it's a utility, raise a ton of money, claim it's a utility. It's like, no, that you can't do that. Like, do it right. There's ways, ways to raise a lot of money in the right way. And the SEC welcomes that. And I think they will figure it out. I, I think you nailed it. Like, they're, they're definitely like overwhelmed right now. And they're probably like, oh my God, how the hell did we figure this out? But that's their job. And they'll figure it out. But don't go do it illegally and do it wrong, like Munchie, et cetera. Don't do that. Just consult lawyers and do it right. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jody Rich from People Browser, and we're releasing a uh, collectible digital asset based on Earth 21 in a few weeks. And I want to come back to something that Tammy said. Um, I don't know if you're all aware, but today there was, in my view, some incredibly important news that I was talking to Patrick about, and that is that um, we are going to have to register with, as, as a money transmitter um, and possibly in every US state. And, and in my mind, um, that completely kills ICOs in the US market. I'd really love to hear what you all think about that because um, I think that has made it mission impossible. So at BitPay, we've been trying to get money transmitters licenses right now in every state. We've been at it for three years and we've got about 20 so far. So that'll be game over if you need an MTL in every state. I would imagine they'd probably say you need an MTL in the state you're based up in the right. Yeah. Uh, to, to, clar to clarify, it was um, by FinCEN, so it's not a federal level. Um, I don't think it did it imply. But they said they, they did mention MTLs, and MTLs are state by state, so it's yeah. not clear what it means yet. Oh, MSC, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and also importantly here, um, this is the first uh, 
This was a statement. This is not a ruling. This is not a fact. So uh, for now, it's just a speculative uh, issue like everything else we deal with in this world. Right. So you know, what I want to say on this, I want to encourage you to get involved civically. Uh, there, we're, in a, we're in a transition period. We're in a period where there are there's some gray area. There's room for discussion. This industry is still evolving. Uh, it will continue to evolve and so what I would encourage is everybody in this room everybody watching online is that if you see something and you have questions around like let's say for example we heard about Reg D offerings which are open to accredited investors meaning that you're worth I don't know over a million dollars or have 250,000 uh, look it up again that's uh, the idea is that you know you have to have a lot of money to lose uh, and you know if we as a society believe that only the wealthy should have access to these opportunities, which are highly speculative and you could lose everything, but the flip side is that you have this risk reward that potentially could you know, yield a, a amazing returns. Uh, if we as a society believe that every single state should have a specific set of rules around money transmitter, or perhaps we believe that there should be some uh, overarching rules that come down from the federal government that makes it easier to do. If we believe that this is what entrepreneurship looks like, you know, we live in a representative democracy. We have a vote. We have the ability to contribute. The Supreme Court has said that money is speech, and uh, we all have the ability to deploy our money and to deploy our votes and to reach out to our representatives and to talk about what we think is the right way to do this. So what I would encourage all of you to do is to reach out to your representative and tell them what you think is wrong and what, most importantly, what you think the correct solution is. Uh, there, there are many different ways for you to do this. Um, I'm trying to remember, there's, an, there's a, an app where you can text a number and it will send a fax to your representative, uh, which is what gets read because they still do most things in paper in DC. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it'll come back to me, but get involved. I, I would just say, so again, it was a statement, not a ruling, and this is all being figured out. Again, this is equity crowdfunding all over again. Look up the Jobs Act. There's state-by-state -state laws for equity crowdfunding in some states, some states, they're all different, some don't have them, some do have them. Those are still being debated and figured out. There is federal law now, again, something called Regulation Crowdfunding, Reg CF, where you can raise up to $1.07 million for a anyone. They don't have to be rich, anyone. We do that. It's legal by the federal government. It's an actual securities exemption. Like, don't I wouldn't like this is. There's no way they're gonna get just get rid of. I think ICOs will come down to earth, and we're all saying that. Like, they you don't need to raise hundred million dollars. You maybe raise ten. Blockchain is not going anywhere. Let's reframe the situation, like the conversation here. ICOs are just another way to raise money, and I think they're great for some people. But I think Sonny said it. Like, some people should just go raise a Series A. And maybe you're not ready for a Series A, so go raise a friends and family. Like, if you can't raise from your friend, trust me, you can't raise from the crowd. <laughs> and like, you really, you can't. I tell that every day. Like, if you can't get your friend to put in money, you're not going to get a stranger to put in money. So, I'm really confident. I'm very bullish on this. Like, blockchain. Anyone knows anything about blockchain? Everyone agrees. Like, it's going to revolutionize every industry. The SEC is not going to squash blockchain. They're going to regulate ICOs as one way to raise money for blockchain companies. That's okay. Regulation is a good thing and happens with every other industry. And I think that, the, just to follow that, I think that the point you're making as well is important to realize that we're talking about this in exactly the way that the SEC is upset about this issue. Right? Right. So we've been talking about this in terms of raising money and investment. That is not the intent of a utility token. And right? so to the extent that we are having this conversation, it is, that's exactly what the SEC is trying to at least put a, a, a set of rules around it that we can all manage. Uh, but with that, we have about five minutes left and I didn't want to cut the audience off with the questions. Uh, so if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, uh, since we did somebody up front, I'm going to try to get somebody in the back, but I'll come back up here. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> can you mention some, something more about uh, Red A Plus as a way to raise your public utilities? And, and also airdrop tokens, right, just with everyone else. Your opinion. Stay away from airdrop, but um, yeah, consult your lawyer. I, I, think, I think airdrops are an interesting idea. I hope they are, I hope we figure that one out. I'm just gonna say that my personal opinion. I don't have any legal opinion on that. Um, 
Reggae Plus, again, here's the thing about Reggae Plus. Reggae has been around forever. Reggae Plus has been around for a few years. Reggae Plus allows you, there's two different types, but the one that everyone hears about is you can raise up to $50 million from anyone, not accredited or accredited. Why hasn't everyone used Reggae Plus now? Oh my god, it's so lovely. You can raise money from anyone. It's super expensive to do, just to file, do all the legal paperwork. We've been quoted on like 50, probably 100k or more just in legal fees. Most people don't have that just to throw away on legal fees. And it takes months to set up. I mean, we're talking like minimum three months, probably more like three, four, five months to set up. Depends. So Reggae Plus is definitely an option, but it's for later stage companies in my opinion. It's like you have cash to do it, you have the time to do it. You actually have to file, so Reg CF, where you can raise the million dollars, we have to file something called a Form C with the SEC before we can launch those deals. We don't, they don't actually approve it, we just have to file it. And we do it all right, but like they don't actually say like, yes, it's approved. Reg A plus, you actually have to go get approval from the SEC. You have to file and then they have to say, yep, we've signed off in this Reg A plus. They're a, bit, they're a bit busy these days. So like, I wouldn't count on that being an easy press. So Reg A plus is a great option for the right companies. And I'm thinking probably more like series B or like, like you have money to do it. They will figure it out. So it's a better option for everyone. But I get people coming to us all the time. Well, I don't want to raise a million. I want to raise 40 million. It's like, well, do you have 100,000? And we tell them that, and they're like, oh, no. So I hope they make it better, but unfortunately, Reg A Plus is not. It's a great option, I want to be clear, for the right companies, but it's not for like the early stage startups to get big. It's going public. Yeah. It's called oh, a, it's a mini IPO. IPO. It's a way you can do a Reg A Plus and then immediately list on the NASDAQ, which people do. You don't have to do that. But yeah, oh, yeah, I should mention that's a good point. The reporting going forward on a Reg A Plus, it's not like a public company, but it's one step below that. If, yeah. if you don't want to deal with reporting nightmare, like, and again, I'm not knocking Reg A Plus, it is not for a three person startup. Right. So that's all. You should just know what you're getting into. But this is, again, also interesting contrast because um, as investors, uh, we also want to know that these companies are healthy, and, and again, we're treating them like real companies. So if we're going to give them that kind of money, we also want to have some recourse and, and reporting from them. So this is the hard thing is, how do you balance all of that? I hope Reggae Plus has become common for ICO so more non-accredited people can get into these deals. Definitely. One more question. Oh, yeah. yeah, first, thank you all. Um, definitely learned a lot. So you talk about ICO, but there are certain steps also that lead to ICO, such as a private sale and free sale. Can you talk more on that too, for early stage companies, how they can go about doing that, so that they can reach the stage of ICO? So, so I actually kind of look at this way. When you're trying to do a private sale or free sale, to me that's almost like going out and trying to raise a Series A round or a C round. If you're trying to raise a $10 million round, go out and get $5 million from institutions. So go meet all the institutions that invest in ICOs. And if they don't like your company and don't give you any money, then you're not going to raise a $10 million public round ending with that. So if you can't get those core institutional investors, and there's a lot out here in Silicon Valley that are investing a lot of ICOs, if they're not going to invest, then you should probably rethink the whole idea altogether. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people um, typically have their private self completed, and they'll do uh, you know, the last 10% um, you know, public, publicly. Yeah, it's a major trend right now. Uh, basically, lots of pro projects cancel their public sale just for the uh, regulation issues. So you would like just keep like a uh, like ten percent as per se, uh, she said. Uh, for two percent, also uh, like ten percent, even not like a public sale. They, they call it a community reward program. So basically, it's kind of like doing this way, probably much, much safe. Um, so also like you raise money from institutions in, uh, and actually. You can finish if your project is good enough. It's not issue with raising money from them. Basically, for us, we usually cannot get in that amount we want for the locations. We usually want to put in two million, then end up get like five hundred ease. Uh, so basically, if it's good projects, not a uh, not an issue, not a like, big issue to raise money. Uh, actually, it's a, a big issue for them to select which one is the best uh, strategic partners. Um, I would just add, like, if you can go get the VC money, go get it, but VC money is only for, like, what, 1.2% of, like, what, so, great, do that if you can, but I just want to not scare everyone, like, the point of what they're saying, I agree with, is, again, what we came back to, be like, it's momentum, this is what crowdfunding, any type of fundraising is all about, you don't want to turn on a public sale, I'm not talking about the ICO, but, like, you don't want to turn on a fundraise publicly, you gotta be careful what I say, with zero dollars raised, and we've learned that for 10 years of experience, like, 
every crowdfunding campaign, equi perks crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, ICOs, the, the success ones do not happen by mistake. They are, they stack the deck. Okay, so if you leave something from anywhere, like people don't just turn on Filecoin and it raised $250 million in 20 seconds. <laughs> no, it didn't. Okay, again, I love Filecoin, but like don't, you're not, that's not how this actually works. So go raise the money first, and it goes back to what I said, if you can't raise money from people that like trust you and like get what you're doing, it can be angel investors, 100 grand here, 50 grand there, Get some money in and then come to our platform or his platform or someone's platform and say, hey, I have a few million lined up. We want to raise 10 million total, a reasonable amount. Cool, let's work together to augment your rate. So thank you very much. Um, we need to finish it there, but um, fabulous panel, thank you. Thank you.